So here's where we left off. We left off, I'm going to go back a slide. We, we talked about the saving side of your financial education. That's really not even the right word for it. I just want to give you a basic understanding of what, what you should know financially. Let's call it that. It's like an intro to your financial education. So we talked about the saving side of things yesterday. We talked about intentionality. We talked about how you save for the present, not for the future. Today we're going to talk about investments, the different ways you can invest. If you were like I was when I was a teenager or 30, <laughs> when you heard the word investment, you thought of the stock market, right? So there's a couple things that we have to keep in mind. The stock market is not really, it's not really the best way to go for the average casual human investor, right? So the stock market is great because you can make a lot of money if you know what you're doing, but it takes a lot of time and market trend data. You have to be basically a day trader or a financial planner. You have to have accounts where you can sit all day and you look at market trends and you speculate and you buy and sell and make multiple transactions and you, you know, exchange currencies and, you know, stocks, bonds, precious metals, all kinds of stuff like that. For the average rookie level, just want to invest in my future kind of person, this is a very conservative investment strategy. Okay, it's a conservative investment strategy. I'm gonna give you the most conservative strategy and you can decide how aggressive you wanna be from there. Right, so this is the base level of investment I think that every human should be making. Just based on the things that I've seen and read and started doing way too late in life. So, we talked about assets being things that you purchase that generate a return on your investment. Right, so if you buy a piece of property and you don't live in that property, right, you buy one piece of property, you're net neutral in the housing market, but you buy a second house and you use that as a rental property, that's an asset. Well, it's an asset anyway because you could sell it for a profit if you needed to, if you had medical bills or whatever. But it's also an asset because it is, it is revenue from capital gains, essentially. I mean, it's not literally, but it's essentially the same thing as capital gains. It's passive income. It's money that's being made without the exchange of labor, right? So it's kind of interesting when the 16th Amendment was passed, which is the Income Tax Amendment, there was much debate about whether or not it was, if it, if it was morally acceptable to tax people's income rather than their capital gains. Because the idea was that your income is not, in other words, you're being paid money for a service, but is it really fair to tax that? Because you're actually exchanging your time as a service for compensation, right? So in other words, some people tried to make the argument in lawsuits that your work is an exchange of services or goods. Anything that you make in addition to that work is taxable, but basically you're exchanging goods or services. And obviously that nothing ever came of that because you know, we still have income taxes. But the reason I tell you that is to understand the difference between IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, 529 plans, all these different plans have different tax, different taxation attach, attached to them, right? So like the difference between a 401k and a 403b. Well, a 403b is going to be somebody who's like a government employee. So there's going to be some tax benefits to that. It, all, it's, it, the process works the same across the board. IRA versus 401k versus 403b, if it's a college savings plan or whatever. It's money you put into an account and they take that money for you and they divvy it up in a diversified amount of places and hopefully you get a return. And you usually do get a return because they know what they're doing. So let's talk about funds. Funds versus just being a day trader, right? So if you were a day trader, you would get multiple monitors and you would go on and you would get an account, right? As some like certified financial planner, you'd have access to the New York Stock Exchange. And so during business hours, and I think it closes at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, while, while the stock market is open, you can trade on all the various markets. And there's multiple exchanges on Wall Street. So the New York Stock Exchange is actually multiple stock exchanges. You have the NASDAQ, you have the Dow Jones, you have uh, S&P 500, right? There's multiple different markets, we'll say. And so when a company wants to go public, like Facebook went public, Tesla went public, Starbucks very recently went public, which was a big deal because they used to only give money to or stock shares to the partners, to their employees. Like Publix is a privately traded company. If you work at Publix, only employees have access to Publix shares, to stock. So being publicly traded means you apply to get on one of the stock exchanges. You have to meet a criteria. 
and then they can accept you and you're allowed to sell portions of your business on that exchange, right? And there's different, there's different criteria for each of the exchanges. So like Tesla might be on one, whereas like, you know, I don't know, like, you know, DuPont might be on another one, right? So the, the point is this, for you to be successful in, in day trading, you're gonna have to know all of the market trends. You're gonna have to keep up with the market trends, at least at a basic level, so you're not throwing your investment away, right? If you're just looking for a way to build some capital gains, some financial security in the long term, you want to you want to learn the value of compounded interest. Compounded interest is great. Compounded interest is actually really impressive, right? But it's it's not flashy. It's not sexy as a, as like a as a form of 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 financial advice, we'll say, right? So sometimes people um, will overcomplicate investing because it's like a five-step plan or a three-step plan or a fifteen-step plan. Remember, there are no guaranteed outcomes in life. That's obviously true in your financial aspect of your life. But in keeping with the vein of the Rockstar Manifesto, you're either being intentional, you're being complacent, or you're being destructive in one of whatever facets of your life. Right? So if you're a really successful person in business and you've achieved all the things that you have to achieve in your field and you have tons of money, but your emotional life is really, really strained or you have a lot of stress or maybe you're marriage is falling apart or your kids resent you or maybe you suffer from panic attacks and maybe you're that means you're neglectful or complacent we'll say or even downright destructive in other aspects of your life right so i do want to say that everyone has the capability of changing their mindset which is kind of what the goal of therapy is right not that this is therapy but the, the idea is not that you are inherently flawed as a person the idea is that your thought process has to change. So if your thought process about a relationship is faulty, we gotta change the thought process, not the relationship, right? So if your thought process about money is problematic, we have to change the thought process. So as long as you're being intentional in the aspects of your life that matter, then you're gonna, you're gonna end up in the right place because you, your, your circumstances are out of your control. All the more reason to be intentional because let's say financially, if you don't prepare yourself for something that could potentially happen in the future, it's going to be a big strain on you. You don't know what medical bills you're going to have. You don't know when you're going to have to move. You don't know when you're going to have to take a step back in your career so your spouse can take a step forward. You don't know if you're just going to get some epiphany that you want to change careers and maybe you want to start a brand new company and you're going to have to pay your own money to float the capital for the startup of that company. You don't know. And quite frankly, just to be honest, the opposite of greed, right? So, so Maslow calls this self-transcendence, right? Let's say that, that what, if, what if our relationship with money was different? What if it wasn't like how much money does a person need and they keep making more and making more and making more and for what? But think about this. It's not just your own personal fortunes, right? A lot of financial experts talk about, well, if you have good intentions, you can do a lot more to benefit other people when you have more resources. It's just the reality of the situation. So even if it, it's, it's better health care for your family, it's, it's better access to education, it's better access to technology, it's, it's not going to eliminate stress and it's not going to prevent circumstances from happening. But quite frankly, middle class people get cancer at the same rates as wealthy people. So the fact of the matter is, is that this is about being intentional to prepare for things that you can't really actually emotionally prepare for, right? And, and hopefully you're philanthropic and you make enough money and then you get to a point where you're trying to reach out and help other people and you're trying to train them up and you're trying to better the lives of other human beings. Like, right? So our, our like mixed relationship with capitalism and money I think is kind of flawed because we think of money as the problem. It's not that money. Money just represents resources. That's just how we get our resources. So in capitalism we exchange goods and services for money and we use that money to purchase resources. It's no different in an agrarian society. It's no different in hunting and gathering. It's no different in government planned economies. It's just how do you get your resources? So the reason I'm telling you that is I think that we can get carried away with the idea of like stock market greed and you know you have the whole you know Occupy Wall Street that, that happened. And I think that's again, like I talked about yesterday, there's a lot of belief among, at least in my age bracket, of people who think that the system is inherently flawed, like it's stacked against them. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that's the case. I just don't. Now, I understand why people do think that. I do understand why they think that. I'm not faulting them for that perspective. But if the system's flawed, you change the system. If the perspective is flawed, you change the perspective. So I genuinely believe to my core 
that people who don't understand capitalism have a flawed perspective on it. That's my genuine belief, right? So again, that's not blaming anybody for anything. I just want to put that out there. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you on the idea of capitalistic greed. I'm trying to sell you on the idea of, of being intentional about what you do with your own personal money. And then that's your business from there, right? How aggressive you want to be or how you want to spend your money, that's on you. But I'm just trying to tell you this is probably the most conservative way. But I just want to show you real dollars and cents here. Right, for instance, one of the things that you probably wouldn't know from school is what are the various funds, right? What is an IRA versus what is a 401k? What is a 403b, 529, right? Uh, pensions versus 401ks and jobs and all that kind of stuff. So we talked about the housing market. We talked about the stock market. Let's talk about funds. When you decide you want to invest in a fund, what you're doing is you're opening an account with a financial institution. You're giving them money and they are essentially investing the money for you. That's essentially what they're doing. So there's various levels of aggression that you can use, right? So inside of a mutual fund, a mutual fund is called that because there's, there is a diversified amount of funds that they have access to that they will put your money in. And they do that, that diversification, to protect you from loss. So let's say that you give them $100 a month, you put it into a mutual fund, automatically paid from your checking account. So what happens then is, you know, $3 go here and $6 go there and $10 go there and, and they, they diversify it and they change it constantly based on how it's doing. But what determines whether it goes up or down depends on what kind of fund it is. So inside of mutual funds, you have other funds like index funds or target date funds. That's like a fund where it, it's got a different fee structure and it's got a different tax structure, right? So you put money into it with the intention of not with not cashing it out until that target date. So it might be 10 years from today. It might be 20 years from today. And there's pros and cons. So you use a target date fund and you may get a better return on your investment, but you can't access it before then. Like if you open a mutual fund, you can always cash that out. And you just sell your shares. Basically, you say, I want to transfer this into my checking account and you pay their fee and then they, they, they sell whatever they bought for you. But when you go on to your app or to the website, all you see is this is how much my fund is worth. You don't know what they paid for. You don't know what they invested it in. You don't know how they diversified. You don't know what companies they bought. They're doing the day trading for you, in essence, right? So inside of mutual funds, you have growth funds versus income funds. And they are called that because of the different strategies. So if your strategy is, I just want to grow my wealth, or I just want to invest in something that's rainy day money, or it's my nest egg, or maybe I want to buy a boat in five years, or whatever. This is, a, this is kind of a better option for you, right? It's capital appreciation. So what, why it's different is they're going to invest in areas of the market that are a little bit more risky, but they're going to have a little better return. So in a growth fund, you're going to see a little bit more investment in the actual stock markets, right? They're going to invest more money in actual company stock that are being bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange, which obviously gives a better chance for return, but at the same time, it carries more risk. So this is a better turnaround for a shorter period of time. Like you open a mutual fund, you go to like wasatch.com, you see all the funds they have available, and you open an account. And then it's like, what's your goal? What do you want to do? Oh, well, in 10 years, I want to buy a boat. Okay, well, let's, let's look at this, this, this type of fund. We have this one growth fund. You can buy into this fund. You just put your money in it every month and then watch what it does. So they, they basically, it's built-in expertise, right? Income funds are a little bit more long-term. Income funds are the t name for this like niche kind of mutual funds that basically they, they have less aggressive targets to them, right? So basically they're, 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 they're being invested in things that are a little bit more steady, government contracts, securities, bonds, and things like that. So basically the idea is that you're not going to see the ebb and flow, right? You're not going to see the, the, the fluctuation. And then when we get into things like index funds, it's called an index fund because they're, they're basing their numbers off of an index, like the S&P 500. So it's called an index fund because basically it represents how the economy is doing. So like the S&P is going to give you an idea, an index of how the economy is doing, right? If these 19 companies are doing well, we're in a good economy. And vice versa, if, these 19, if our economy is good, those companies are going to do well. So basically what's happening is they're almost, I don't want to say guaranteeing, but they're matching the index. So you put money, basically you're giving the company a loan, you give them money, they invest it based on the index projections, and it's like guaranteed that they're going to hit their projection goals. 
It's a better long-term strategy. It's a really specific kind of in, a mutual fund. An index fund is a, is a type of mutual fund because it's still diversified your money, right? Instead of buying like three shares of Tesla, you're giving them money and it's getting divvied up in different directions, right? So it's still a mutual fund. You're not choosing which stocks you buy and how you invest. You're giving money to a fund and that fund is being managed by a fund manager and they're diversifying all the money from all of their, you know, investors. And then it kind of, you know, works itself out that way. So over a long period of time, there's pros and cons. A standard mutual fund is going to have more fees because people take them out quicker. You put money in your mutual funds, when the market is good, you're like, oh, I have $10,000 in that account right now. Cash out. Put it in my checking account. Well, they charge you a fee, right? And then you pay capital gains tax on anything that you make. So, right, I, I, you bought $3,000 worth. You put $3,000 in this year. You made an extra $5,000, you're going to pay money off the difference, right? You're going to pay a tax on that, on your capital gains, because it's a type of income. So that's why when you have a diversified portfolio, like your taxes are kind of a nightmare, because you have capital gains that you made, you have investments you made money from, you might have properties, you might have tax write-offs of things that you paid for that, you, that don't count towards your income, right? It's, it's really kind of, it gets complicated really quick. So you have index funds, you have mutual funds. Again, things like IRAs. The, an IRA is different than a 401k in this way. An IRA is a fund that you open up. You pick the company, you choose the fund, you open it up. So your 401k can be part of that. But the 401k came out as a market fund to replace a pension. A pension was something that like if your grandfather was a mail carrier or if you worked in a coal mine for 40 years, well, they had a bank account somewhere. And so they took money and they put it in a savings account for your retirement. And they found out, well, we can't save up enough money. And so companies started investing the pensions in like the stock market. And the stock market would crash and you as an entire company would lose their pension. So it's horrible. Not only that, the pension is run by the company in a company's account. So if you quit your job, you lose your pension, all that retirement that was saved up. So people would have to stay in their job at their company for 40 or 50 years even if they could move somewhere or they hated their job. So there's a downside to pensions. So rather than just putting it in an account, now it's all virtually invested. So a 401k is a retirement fund. It's like a mutual fund that's for retirement and it's tax deferred. So you don't pay the taxes on it until you like take them out. And a 403b is just like a 401k, but it's for like government employees. So if you're like a state employee, you work for, you know, like, like as a teacher, right? Mine's a 403b, it's not a 401k. It's just a tax code difference, right? And then you have savings, various savings plans that have different taxation on them, like a, like, like a 529 plan, I think, is with the college education, what you call Florida prepay. Your parents put money in that. It's got a better tax structure to it because it's for education, right? There's, there's benefits. There's tax benefits to, to all of these. They all have different taxation structures. So you can talk to uh, a financial specialist about the, the differences between all of them. But let's keep it simple. Just a basic education. I'll just give you some examples of companies that I like that I can vouch for. Again, I'm a novice investor. I'm a very conservative investor. I'm looking for long-term safe gains, not fluctuation, right? I'm not real keen on the stock market, and I'm not going to learn. So the reality is, is that I want to put my money somewhere where it's going to grow into more money when I need it. So my long-term investments are in mutual funds. Even my kids' school is in mutual funds. It's not in like a savings plan, it's in a Wasatch fund. So Wasatch is the company that we use. We've had a Janus fund before, and then we cash that out and open a new one, open the Wasatch fund. I'm looking into Vanguard. Vanguard is one that, that, that financial advisors like a lot, at least the ones that I've talked to. So if you're gonna get an index fund, that's a good one to look into. That's a very stable company. So those are just some examples of names that you can look up. These are financial institutions. They're firms that invest in mutual funds for you, right? So if you want to look into it and you're like, what does that even look like? How do I even open a fund? Well, you go to their website, you open up an account. You could probably get somebody on the phone if, they, if you wanted them to walk you through that. Or you could talk to somebody that's a financial planner and they could give you more details on which one is the right plan. But basically, it's a company. And you go to their website, you open an account, and once you have an account, you just start putting money in it as an auto pay. Now, let's, let's see what it looks like. Just kind of wrap all this investment up to give you some real numbers. Okay, and again, this is basic stuff. There's a lot more that you would have to learn, but let's look at now. To be fair, an, an average interest rate of 15% is that's 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 that is optimistic. We'll say it is not impossible or unrealistic, but it's not going to average that, 
right? It's probably going to be like, depending, I mean, it's not impossible, right? It depends on what you're investing in. But let's say 15, somewhere between 8 and 13. It just depends on what funds you're using, right? So what I did was I went to a, a, a compounded interest calculator, and I just typed in a bunch of different numbers to see how these things change. And the point I want you to understand is this. Here's why compounded interest is an underrated topic, right? You want to, people like Warren Buffett, this is how he made the vast majority of his money, is putting it in a place that was safe, and it very gradually turned into more money because of compounded interest, right? He made the vast majority of his money after the age of 60. In fact, I think it was after the age of 66, right? And here's why. Compounded interest works like a mortgage in reverse. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say your mortgage interest rate is 3%. Let's say it's 3%. So you owe, you, you buy a house, the house is $230,000 or whatever. So every monthly payment, and they divide that up over 360 payments. So every one of your 360 payments, you pay 3% interest on. So that's 3% of this amount every time, every time, every time, every time, every time, right? And that percentage obviously diminishes because you're chipping away at it. So compounded interest works... The, diff the opposite of that, as you continue to put more money into the account, that interest is paid on top of the new number, right? The new number. So let's just say, for instance, that you, you, you got an average interest rate of 15% over 20 years, right? And I don't know how realistic that is, but let's just look at it, right? So let's say that you're 18, you graduate, you get some money for graduation, you're like, I'm going to open a fund, and you take $500 and you put it in a mutual fund like a target date fund, and you say, I'm going to open this thing up, and I'm going to cash it in in 20 years, okay? Just in time for your 20th reunion, GBHS, 2040, right? So you put it in a fund. Well, I guess you guys are 21, so that's stupid. Just erase that. Never mind. So, <laughs> but you get my point. So you're going to open this fund, you're going to close it, or you're going to cash it out in 20 years. This is why you can cash your money out from mutual funds earlier than that, but it doesn't benefit, like notice how much more exponential growth you have as your money grows, right? So it's exponential in a literal sense. So it's 15% of this number, which is a new number. And then the following year, it's 15% of that number, which is a new number. And the following year, it's 15% on top of that. So if this number were to hold true, plus or minus 5%, right? Some years it might fluctuate. It might be as low as 10. Some year it might be as high as 20. And you can change the numbers. You can put in 8% as your average and 10 and whatever. You can do what you want. But let's just say it was 15% for math. All right, if you, so your total investment over 20 years, you put in $500 to open the account. So obviously we gotta count that towards your investment. And then you put in an auto pay from your checking account of $100 a month for 20 consecutive years without fail. You don't even notice it. It auto pays out of your account. So your total investment, if this were a savings account, you would have $24,500 in that account. But this is the beauty of compounded interest when it comes to capital gains. By putting it in an account that grows and builds on itself, the longer you leave it in, the better your returns are. So using a compounded interest rate of 15%, plus or minus 5 every year, basically your, your investment in this is $24,500. The interest alone that you've made is $106,615.57. So that means when you go to cash out and you say, oh, I want to take all this money out of this mutual fund, you're sitting on $131,000, $131,115. You put in $24,000, you put in $100 a month, and it turned into $131,000. Now keep in mind, that's one investment. $100 seems like a lot, but it's not. You can find that in your budget, right? And the longer you put in, the better your returns are. And the more you put in, the more your returns are. So start when you're 18 and you don't have much money. Not when you're 30. That's a misconception. People say, oh, I can't invest, I don't have money. Wrong. You can invest. You can. It might start out as $50 a month, but if you put money away, it's just going to grow. It's just going to build. So the earlier you start, the more interest you're going to make. Just like if you're going to buy a house in five years and you know you're where you're supposed to be, then buy a house now. That's five yes, less years of payments. It's five less years of interest. You're just delaying the inevitable, right? So here's the thing. And again, the numbers get stupid when you go up to 20%, which I just don't think is realistic. But if you go up to 20%, now you're looking at an investment that's sitting in an account of north of $220,000, and you put $24,000 into it. But the point is this. 
That's very, very, very minimal commitment from you, $100 a month. That's middle class America finding $100. That's like you probably pay that in, in multiple streaming services if you have like three streaming services, like family plans or whatever. I mean, you might spend that at, at Whataburger every month. I don't know. Hopefully not. But the point is you can find $100 a month. If you make it a habit, you make it an auto pay and you budget for it, that turns into a lot of money. And that's just one part of your portfolio. That doesn't include if you own rental properties. That doesn't include if you have other investments. It doesn't include if you actually have stocks. That doesn't include your 401k that you can use to retire. Oh, and also it doesn't include your salary from the job that you go to every day. So capital gains are a source of income. Now, unlike the stock market, you're not getting paid dividends for this. So you're not going to see a cent until you sell them. That's a downside. But you're not going to see the volatility like you are in the stock market. It's, this is set it and forget it. So this is a really conservative strategy. But it's a strategy that's very doable, right? And it's probably the only time you'll ever hear that explained, right? So open a mutual fund, find the right one for you based on whatever your strategy is going to be. And you're like, I don't have a strategy. Talk to someone and they can convince you of what the best strategy for you is. I'm not a financial advisor. Find the right place to put your money, put it there consistently and leave it alone. 20 years is not that long for you. I know it seems like a long time, but you'll be 37, 38 years old in 20 years. And imagine when you want to buy a house because now you have little kids and you want to move back to Gulf Breeze, Florida, and you're like, oh my goodness, every house here is $450,000. Well, there's your down payment, bro. There it is. You're not going to save up $130,000 in your savings account. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You have to take a little bit and grow it into more. So this is a, this is a again, the numbers obviously are probably a little inflated, but even if you see a smaller return than that, that's a significant margin. Again, for doing nothing. This is not a job. You didn't make chairs and sell them. You didn't sell cars. You put money in a place, they closed the door, it turned into more money, right? Black magic, sorcery, right? So you don't have to know how it's doing what it's doing. That's a benefit of mutual funds over say like day trading in the stock market. You just have to put it there, you have to leave it there, and you have to watch it do its thing. Yeah, it drops, I mean it can drop, but it's way more conservative in its risk than the stock market. So again, it's a lot of terminology. If you have questions, write them down, right? And we'll get to them. Just to give you a basic, where do I go from here? If you want to continue to educate yourself, these are four books that I would recommend. I've read them myself. There are other books I have not read, so they're probably great, maybe even better, but I can't vouch for them. These are books that I would recommend. Now, again, this, this is not light reading. It's not entertaining page turners that you're going to, you know, cozy up to over the weekend and and rifle through. But these are the tools to teaching you the things that people know, right? Ignorance is not an excuse in the information age. It's just not, Like right? If you want to learn about, I don't know, like crocheting, if you want to learn how to play the guitar, if you want to learn how to take apart an engine, right? You go on YouTube and you watch a how-to, you read a book. You have access to information. I just want to encourage you, don't be complacent about this and then be disappointed about where you're at. There's nothing stopping you. It's not a level of education that's stopping you from reading, listening to podcasts, going to seminars. It's an investment. You invest in your knowledge, you're going to make better decisions. And again, you don't have to read all of them. You can read them in parts. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Like this one, I will teach you to be rich. I like that. Um, so that's from Eat Sethi. Uh, and, and his deal is he's a younger guy. He's kind of a dynamic guy. He's been on a few podcasts. He's really kind of, he's, he's really kind of a dynamic speaker. But this book is interesting. Obviously, the title is triggering on purpose, so you'll pick it up and read it. But the idea here is he gives you actual methodical step-by-step -step instructions of what you do. When you open a checking account, do this five things with it and set up these various folders, as he calls them. Right? That's where I learned about target date funds, various types of index funds. So he will tell you this is the advantage of this fund over that fund. Put your money here and not there. So again, it's a little formulaic, but... If you know nothing, that's a good, that's a good place because he's going to tell you, like, here's what you do with your money. Boom. And it's like a, it's a paradox or a paradigm shift, right? So I like Chris Hogan a lot. He's written several things. That's a very famous book. That's a national bestseller. It's Everyday Millionaire. So Chris Hogan is going to tell you from a self-made millionaire that came from virtually nothing um, the things that you can do. Right, and it's things like budgeting, and he talks about how much money people spend that they don't realize they're spending, and where do you, what are the things that rich people do with their cars that you know other people don't do, right? And I don't mean poor people; I mean like middle-class people lose money by 
buying these cars and wealthy people spend their money on these cars. Like they don't buy coffee at Starbucks, right? And middle class people do buy coffee at Starbucks. So it's like simple things like that. That's a good book to read. Uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, of course, I would recommend. Again, that one, like read it in sections if it's not holding your attention because there's a lot of good information in there. He does tell stories in it, so it's not hard to follow. It's not hard to follow to understand what he's saying, but it's, it's, it's not a page turner, right? It's, I mean, it's probably not going to hold your attention. So read it in sections, take something out of it. Get a Financial Life is a little, it's not quite as good, right? So that's Beth Cobliner. Um, and, and basically she goes through, it's kind of, it's, it's less of a how-to guide. It's more of like an explanation of personal finance. So that's a little bit more of a basic introduction, which I like. It's geared at people in their 20s and 30s, which is basically you. So this is based on the idea of things that people don't know because they don't learn them in school. Here are the basics that people in the field of finance know that you would not know unless you were in the field of finance or someone taught you, right? So there's that. All right, again, if you have questions, write those questions down.